In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Learning should commence at birth and cease only at death. Judging from that quote on its own, it's pretty clear that Albert Einstein was a fan of being a lifelong learner. But how many of us actually take that bit of advice to heart? It's one of history's greatest minds talking, and how many of us actually listen? It seems like education in America as a whole kind of has a shelf life to a degree. I mean, when you think about it, we spend the first quarter of our lives being educated. We spend time in the classroom acquiring knowledge about a various number of subjects, but then all of a sudden, once graduation hits, whether it's high school or college, it's like a giant switch gets flipped. No more learning. Time to get to work. It's kind of interesting that we spend the better part of our first 20-ish years of life learning But then we spend the rest of our time just kind of coasting on the laurels of our knowledge. It's not just secular education that kind of tends to go through that that sort of phase, though. If you can think back to your own own younger days, uh, Christian education kind of follows the same thing. If God brought you to faith as a, a young child, you can probably think back to those days of Sunday school, vacation Bible school, confirmation class, these sort of formal opportunities where you're in a a classroom with a teacher or a pastor learning about the Bible, learning about your Savior. But for how many kids is confirmation not a a leaping uh, leaping off point into their adulthood as a Christian, but it becomes a drop-off point? They're done. We've called it quits. If God brought you to faith as an adult, maybe you can think back to those Bible information classes that you took with a pastor, and it was weeks, maybe months worth of of more formal education, but after those days are, are done and gone, it becomes much more difficult for us to continue learning. For whatever reason, we seem to have a point in our lives where a switch gets flipped. Do you ever wonder why that happens. Why, why is that the case, that we spend so much of our younger days learning, but then stop all of a sudden? I think there's, there's two answers to it. The first of which is that learning takes hard work. If you've ever tried to learn a second language, you know that's true. Even if you have Rosetta Stone or Duolingo or a teacher who's completely fluent, It still takes this massive investment of your own time and energy and focus to learn something new. So it takes hard work, but then sometimes the subject matter is hard as well. You know, it's one thing for a kid to learn their multiplication tables, basic math. It's another to learn the quadratic formula in algebra. It's another thing entirely once you get to calculus. So as the complexity of a subject matter Increases, so does the amount of effort it takes to understand it. And for those reasons, whether it's secular education or Christian education, it seems to be that the hard work and the the difficult subject matter kind of force people to, to shy away from continuing to learn. It's not just modern learners, though, that have to, to jump over those, those two main obstacles. It goes all the way back to Jesus' day as well. That's the reason that we hear, actually, about so many of Jesus' followers turning away from him in the first verse of our gospel reading. At that point, many of his followers left. Well, what's that point? Just the day before this mass exodus of disciples, Jesus had performed one of his most well-known miracles. He'd fed 5,000 people, probably more, actually, when you include women and children, but he fed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two small fish. An astounding miracle. So the next day... Those same crowds, they naturally go back looking for Jesus. I'm sure some of them just wanted a meal. Maybe some of them wanted to see another miracle. But a few probably wanted to learn more about this miraculous man who could do these things. But when they finally catch up with Jesus, instead of giving them more bread, he gives them a a teaching. And it's a teaching that's considerably harder for them to swallow. Most of John chapter 6 is this, this big discussion back and forth between Jesus and these crowds. We, we call it the bread of life discourse. And it's difficult enough that modern theologians and scholars argue about exactly what it means. 
But if you had to summarize it in one sentence, Jesus tells the crowds, I am the bread of life that came from heaven, and anyone who eats this bread will live. Grammatically speaking, that is not a difficult sentence to comprehend. It's a pretty simple sentence, but it's packed full of meaning, and, and that's what the crowd starts to struggle with. You see, this crowd especially struggled because this all happened up in, in Galilee. That's the northern part of the Holy Land. That's where, where Jesus grew up. That's where these crowds are from. So they probably ran into each other a number of times. They, they knew Jesus, maybe knew his family. And so they can't really reconcile what Jesus is telling them. Jesus says, I came down from heaven. And their response, actually recorded in John, is, well, isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? How could he come down from heaven? Or Jesus says, I am the bread of life. This bread is my flesh, and whoever eats this bread will live. Well, the crowd responds with, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It was hard for them to reconcile who Jesus truly was with who they thought he was. And that made it all the more difficult for them to grasp what he was simply trying to teach them. They even admit that much to Jesus, to his face. They say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And at that point, almost as one, they all, they all turn on their heel and leave. And so Jesus watches as this, this cloud of dust retreats toward the horizon, as thousands of feet turn away from him. Well, then Jesus turns to the 12, 12 disciples who are left. And he asks them, you don't want to leave too, do you? Put yourself in the disciples' place for a moment. You're watching the same cloud of dust retreat. You're feeling that same sort of sucker punch of lost momentum in your stomach where you had thousands of people following along with you and then 95% of them are gone. You've heard this hard teaching about Jesus being the bread of life. In fact, you've heard a number of hard teachings Jesus has said. That a person needs to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. That it's better for someone to cut off their hand rather than let that hand allow them to sin or cause them to sin. That Jesus, this seemingly human man walking alongside you, is the same person as the God of your forefathers, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You don't know exactly what Jesus is going to say next, but you can safely assume it's probably going to challenge you a little bit. So wouldn't it be a lot easier to go with the crowds? Because those crowds aren't just turning back from Jesus because they're bored with him. They're, the Greek verb says they're turning away back towards their former way of life, back towards those Jewish teachings that they'd grown up with and grown comfortable with. So as one of Jesus' disciples, how would you answer his question? As you're in the, the very small minority of people still around him. You don't want to leave too, do you? How do you answer that question as a modern disciple of Christ? And Jesus' teachings can be just as hard for us today as it was for those, those crowds back in Galilee. Even though we have the rest of the New Testament that helps explain the Gospels, even though we have book upon book upon book of, of these educated biblical scholars, there are still some things that Jesus says that are difficult for us to grasp or sometimes difficult for our hearts to believe. Here's an example of, of a teaching that's kind of hard to understand. On the one hand, the prophet Isaiah said that Jesus would be called the Prince of Peace. But then on the other hand, Jesus himself says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. How do you make those two work? Because they're both true. The Bible does not have any errors in it, but... How can you grasp how those things can be true? It's a difficult thing to understand. Or how about, uh, how about a teaching of the Bible that's not hard to understand, but maybe hard to put into practice? Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. How much easier it is to say that than to actually do it, right? Jesus' teachings can be hard. They can be difficult to understand on a, a mental level, difficult for us to believe in our hearts as we still battle with our, our sinful nature that tells us, don't believe anything what he's saying, follow your own heart. So how do you answer that question? 
you don't want to leave too, do you? What's our reaction when the teachings in the Bible get a little bit more difficult than third grade Sunday school level? Do we take up the challenge of learning more and more from our Savior? Or are we okay with just the basics? The things we picked up maybe decades ago and have probably forgotten some, if not most of. Are we apathetic in general towards our Christian educations now that we're not in formal Christian education? More importantly, how do we change? How do we change from Christians who are apathetic towards learning these truths of God's word into Christians who hunger and thirst for the bread and water of life? How do we flip that switch back to the on position? It all comes through refocusing. Refocusing on who it is we are learning from and why we are learning from him. And thankfully, all that is answered in Peter's own answer to that question Jesus asked him over 2,000 years ago. Jesus says, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter steps up and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to know and to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Peter gives us answers with his own answer. He starts off strong. He says, Lord. He doesn't say rabbi. He doesn't say teacher. He doesn't give any of these common monikers that the common people had given to what they thought was a common man. He says, Lord, with a capital L. Peter knows exactly who Jesus is. And he isn't some uppity son of a carpenter from Nazareth. He's the true son of God himself. The claim that Jesus makes is not false. It's backed up by scroll after scroll of Old Testament prophecies that Jesus had fulfilled. It's reinforced by miracle after miracle, proving that he has the power of God flowing through his veins. Peter knows exactly who's standing in front of him. And he knows exactly why he needs to keep learning from Jesus, from the Christ, from the promised Messiah. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. No one else has what Jesus has. The words of eternal life itself. Now, what are those words of eternal life, though? In a broad sense, the words of eternal life are every word that came out of Jesus' mouth. Every word that God had recorded for us in the Bible, because the entire Bible testifies, witnesses to Jesus as the true Savior. But you could boil those words down a little bit, too, to just four. Four words that are the words to eternal life. Your sin is forgiven. Those aren't empty words spoken from one Christian to another, spoken from a pastor to a congregation. They're powerful. Because it's not just a Christian saying them, it's not just a pastor, it's Jesus himself speaking through the mouths of his people that your sin is forgiven. And Jesus can say that because he's the one that went out and earned that forgiveness for us. He's the one who lived a perfect life in our place and sacrificed his own life so that our sins would not be held against us, so that he could truly say, your sins are forgiven. I'm the one who's paid for all of them. It's mine to give to you for free. No one else has the words of eternal life. No one else has what Jesus has to offer. There are other religions, other worldviews that have claims, say they can get you to heaven or some sort of positive afterlife, but none of them can follow up on their promises. None of them can come through like Jesus already came through for us. Why do we strive as Christians to learn more and more from and about our Savior? Because like Peter, we know exactly who he is. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man, but the Son of God and our Savior. And we know exactly what he has to give us. That's eternal life. In Christianity, you aren't learning for a diploma. You aren't learning for an advanced degree. But you're learning for life 
itself. Not just a life here on earth, but a life forever in heaven. Continue to learn for life. You have younger brothers and sisters in the faith doing just that, well, they will be doing just that in a couple of months, at Michigan Lutheran Seminary. As a member of the faculty there, I can confidently tell you that they are learning for life right alongside you, even though you're separated by however many hundreds of miles. As a school, we try to foster an atmosphere of learning that whether you succeed or whether you fail, everything can be used to help you grow, whether it's socially or academically or physically or spiritually. And so we grow together in our faith in Jesus whether it's in chapel or in the classrooms or in these student-led Bible studies that pop up in the dorms late at night when a kid can't sleep. We learn for life and we learn together. But then our faith, that education, bleeds outward. It's not compartmentalized into the room that is the chapel. You can find kids growing in their faith in every aspect of life at Michigan Lutheran Seminary. On every team, during every rehearsal, in every practice, They have their formal education, but then they have an informal living out of what they've learned. And in that way, MLS, Michigan Lutheran Seminary, is actually really similar to Abiding Grace. Because here, too, you have opportunities to grow in your faith right alongside fellow believers. You have these these golden moments on, on Sunday mornings for worship, for Bible class, to expand your knowledge and to solidify it just by hearing and and focusing and meditating on the word that God puts before you on a weekly basis. You've got Bible information courses, which aren't aren't just for for visitors. You can go back through and and take it and relearn all those truths that maybe have, have flown the coop a little bit. But you don't just have opportunities here at Abiding Grace. You have resources. You've got a pastor, a vicar, a summer ministry assistant. If you run across those those difficult teachings, those hard teachings in God's word, You have people you can ask for help. I don't have a a lot of experience as far as being a church, a a pastor in a church, but I can tell you that pastors love, they love it when people ask them questions for two reasons. One, they they love learning alongside their members, but two, it helps them to justify all the years they went to school. So if you have issues, go and talk to your pastor, go and talk to your vicar. They want to help you. They want to help you grow in faith, and in turn, you'll help them grow as well. You don't just have opportunities to learn, though, here. You have opportunities to live out what you've learned in your own neighborhoods, in your own communities. Through all the different outreach events you have here at church, you have these wonderful opportunities to share the life that Jesus has given to you. Keep learning. Keep inviting others to learn with you. Jesus' teachings will not always be easy. They won't always be easy for us to grasp with our minds or to grasp with our hearts either. But when those teachings get hard, when you feel a little run down, when you feel like maybe I should turn on my heel and and leave for a little bit, refocus. Listen to Peter's answer. Know who it is that you're learning from and know what it is that he's offering you. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and lives through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together in confessing our faith using the Nicene Creed, which is found on page 10 in your worship folder. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.